Thank you, you Johanna. <clears throat> Thank you for the very, really nice uh, introduction. So. Um, so in the next uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I will uh, tell you the structure function and, uh, and the cofactor regulation of Adam TS-13. So I have nothing to disclose. So for the last 10 years, my laboratory has been focused on three questions. Uh, first one is uh, what are the structure components of Adam TS-13 required for recognition and cleavage of VWF? And the second question is, uh, what are the potential cofactors that could regulate the proteolysis of VWR by NTS-13? The last one I want to tell you is, uh, how do TTP autoantibody bind and uh, uh, whether we can actually use the, 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 the thing that we learned to re-engineer NTS-13 so to, to make it uh, resist to autoantibody inhibition. So I start out with this slide. Uh, so 2001, when I was working with Evan Sadler in St. Louis, we first reported with Dominic Chen and uh, Fujikawa the completed domain structure of Adam TS-13. Showing here, the Adam TS-13 contains uh, multiple domain on the N terminal. There's a protease domain, and then there's a, a very long C terminal domain. So, of course, the, the obvious question is, what are these domains doing? In order to answer this question, the first experiment I did uh, while I was still in Evan Sutter's lab is to make a serious C-terminal truncation and then show that the protein truncated off the spatial domain is still doing a pretty good job uh, in terms of uh, cleaving a multimeric VWAP. However, to cleave a peptide after Kokame discovered VW73 is sufficient for Adam TS13 to recognize and cleave, and I can show that this way, so the, the peptide actually don't need all the domains. So once you add a disinherent domain and a thrombospondin repeats one, the activity start to increase, but it take longer. Uh, until you, uh, the spatial domain is added, so you have full activity. And so that indicating cleavage of a peptide and cleavage of full length VWA is, uh, is different. So uh, this has some implication when you interpret a clinical assay, uh, which is most of done by the peptide assay. Furthermore, we have shown that uh, once we set up an assay with uh, under flow shear stress using this mini vortex, uh, we can show that LMTS-13 uh, can be cleaved by LMTS-13 under this uh, rotational uh, shear force. So you can see here, full lines cleave very nicely, uh, time dependently. Uh, if you add EDTA, activity is abolished. And so other construct can work pretty well until the MDTCS, once it, you remove this uh, uh, spatial domain. Or even you make a point mutation or a deletion, small deletion, six amino acid deletion in the spatial domain, you can actually severely impair the proteolytic activity this way. Furthermore, after we developed the intravital microscope uh, using ferricular injury on the uh, mesentery artery, we can show if you, uh, this is a knockout, and the, the thrombus will form a complete occluded vessel within five minutes, and showing here, and then if you uh, infuse a different construct of a recombinant MTS-13, you can actually slow down and reduce the thrombus formation. So showing here is a full length, you can do this by it prolong the occlusion time and the, the cup domain can do the same. Karen just showed you, we actually just adding the MDTCS domain into a AAV vector and inject on the mice and they can completely correct the TTP phenotype uh, triggered by toxin. So I guess uh, up to date, with the data from our lab and also data from uh, Evan Sadler's lab, as well as Jim Fei Dong and David Lance lab and uh, Akiyama, uh, we all seem to come to agree that to cleave Bangor brand factor, particularly the A2 domain or VW73 peptide, the only thing you need is, uh, is the domain that up to the spatial domain, the end terminal part of the, of the stuff here. So, and the question is, uh, so this, uh, the A2 domain, unfolded A2 domain wrapped around the different domain, and then this way, now you can position the protease domain, and the protease domain become really happy, see, oh, everything's wrapped around me, so now I can cleave. 
because uh, Evan uh, slab also shown if you replace the space domain with uh, the LMTS LMTS four or five, and you can actually screw back. You still cleave with the bread, but cleave at a different spot. So that means space domain is really important to determine the substrate specificity. I will come back to, to this a little bit later because of the importance of this. And the question now is what are the function of the C terminal, the distal part of the C terminal, like a thrombus bonding motif starting from two to eight and the cup domain. And so over the years, there's uh, quite a bit of evidence to show that this domain may be required to bind the native UL vitabra or a soluble vitabra without a, uh, in the absence of shear stress. And the C terminal is also re seems to require to bind the endothelial cell. Recently, we are from Evans Lab showing that the, the C terminal may be allosterically uh, inhibiting the N terminal part of the molecule. And Jim Wei Dong's lab showed that uh, the C, this part of the molecule may have disulfide bond reducing activity. However, the physiological function of this has not been actually looked at. So we set up an assay we're using microfluidic system and using the knockout mouse uh, whole blood and then uh, reconstituted with uh, the just C terminal part of the, of the LMTS-13. You can see the amount of platelet aggregation on collagen surface is diminished in a dose-dependent manner. However, this uh, activity can be completely abolished if you, this protein was pre-treated with, uh, with uh, n acetyl valema, which is block the free cysteine on the C-terminal part of the molecule. There's a multiple free, free dye, uh, in the C-terminal part of the molecule being detected by labeling and mass spec identification. And same thing if you're using the thrombus bonding uh, repeated five to eight, to eight and then couple domain, you can also have exactly the same activity, and this activity can be abolished by treating treatment with uh, NEM as well. So suggesting that the C-terminal part of the MTS have direct antithrombotic activity uh, independent of uh, proteolytic activity. And this is not only shown in the in vitro the ex vivo flow chamber, but we also did this uh, URV platelet decorated URV formation in the mesentery uh, venue. You can also appreciate that if you add an active atom uh, TS13, so the length of the URV is significantly reduced by almost like 80% reduction. However, if this, uh, the full length protein treated with the NEM that block this uh, C terminal free thought, and then uh, the, the activity uh, seems to be diminished uh, a little bit, but it's not uh, tremendous. However, right, if you add just C terminal, and C terminal can do the same thing in a dose dependent manner. So, whether it's a T, T2C or T5C, this activity can be also abolished by treatment with NEM. So, both in ex vivo and in vivo data suggest that the C terminal uh, LMTS13 really have uh, a direct anti thrombotic activity, perhaps uh, through the disulfide bond reduction uh, mechanism. This is independent of proteolytic activity. And the N terminal uh, really actually wrapped around the VWS central A2 domain, and then that confirmed the cleavage specificity and also uh, cleavage efficiency. So the next thing I want to tell you is the potential cofactor that regulate uh, LMTS-13 cleavage. So as you know, fungal band factor is very long. As I said, this prodomain, once the prodomain gets cleaved, and this is a released polypeptide, on the end terminal, there's a D prime D3 domain, is a factor A bond inside, and the A1 domain is a, a platelet GP1B bond inside. Of course, A3 binds to collagen. And the, the question we have at the time is whether binding of, of factor eight or plate GP1B could somehow alter the domain-domain interaction and in which uh, could alter the sensitivity of uh, VWR to proteolysis by LMTS-13. So in order to do that, uh, so uh, using the flow shear stress assay, if you add full length atom factor eight, you can see the, the cleavage product, which is 350 kilodalton product uh, measured by Western blood. You can see it's a dose dependent increase with the amount of factor you added. And factor eight B domain deleted, called a factor eight SQ, 
and this molecule, the B domain is removed, this can pretty much do the same thing because this also has both clotting activity. Once you remove this VW binding site, which is called a little A3 region, so if you remove that, then this construct doesn't work at all, even though you have still have the heavy chain and the light chain, but this protein does not bind to VW anymore, so you can see the quantitation here. So the other question we were asking, what happens if you have just the light chain alone but has a VW binding site? So we made this a serious construct which is a heavy chain and light chain with the binding site and, and the light chain without the factory binding site. And you can see this one, if you added this light chain, just light chain alone, you can pretty much see enhancement of the cleavage band. Pretty similar to the factor 8 SQ or folates. However, if you remove this VW binding site, then this doesn't work. This is, this is a control, and, it is, and then the heavy chain alone also didn't work at all. So, so this actually uh, suggests that light chain is uh, sufficient. Then what about in vivo? This could be a you know, text tube uh, phenomenon. So in vivo, we have hemophilia mice in UPenn. And so hemophilia mice, if you look at the hemophilia mice and, and, and the normal mice, the VWF multiple distribution at a steady state, they seem pretty similar if you correct the antigen level. But the hemophilia mice has about 1.4 to 1.5 fold uh, increase in antigen concentration. The striking thing is if you challenge these mice with a hydrodynamic injection, now you suddenly see the massive release of uh, beta bread into circulation. And it's showing here. If you reconstitute these uh, hemophilia mice with, uh, with a functional factor 8 or even the light chain with beta bread binding site, you can pretty much restore this is a massive increase of uh, high molecular weight of Vita Brad, and this quantitation shown here. So, summary two, uh, I've shown you that the bonding of factor A to, to Vita Brad is required for enhanced proteolysis by LMTSA under flow shear stress, but if you do the, all the experiment with under static and denatured condition, you're not going to see anything. Light chain of factor A appear to be sufficient to enhance the cleavage of VW by LMTS setting, both in vitro and in vivo. Finally, uh, I have not shown you the data. If you add a, a platelet or a platelet GP1B into factor A, uh, so they actually can synergistically enhance the cleavage of VW by LMTS under flow shear stress, which was published in JBC uh, 2011 from our lab. Finally, the reconstitution of factor eight in hemophilia mice can restore the VW homeostasis under pathological challenges. So these are all uh, indicating the fact that maybe also platelet, maybe a physiological cofactor that can regulate VW cleavage by LMTS-13 under a pathophysiologic condition. So the last piece of, of data I want to show you is where TTP autoantibody bind uh, on the LMTS-13. And can we actually re-engineer LMTS-13 so now we can avoid antibody binding or inhibition? So over the years, we have collected more than 67 patients with acquired TTP and inhibitor in collaboration with Haifeng Wu and Hao Kuang from Ohio State University and also University of Northeastern University. So we mapped most of the antibody and it seems like most of the antibodies have seems to bind to the spatial domain. And if you take away the spatial domain, the, the binding frequency uh, dramatically reduced by uh, almost 90%. And similar data was also obtained by Lucan et al. Uh, from Jan Warburg's lab. And furthermore, with the crystal structure obtained by Akiyama, as well as the, the data published from POS from Jan Warburg's lab, showing that uh, this area, uh, the amino acid from arginine 660 and uh, glutamine, glutamic acid uh, 664, and this area plus the two adjacent uh, residue are uh, the major binding site for uh, patient autoantibody. Because any mutation here, you could, uh, for example, mutation to alanine, you can kind of abolish the binding, uh, binding site. Now, 
We also show that, so this is the area that this, the antibody seems to find. And if you remove this part, you can pretty much kill the enzyme. Even, you know, if you delete this uh, six amino acid, you kill the enzyme activity. Even when you make a single point mutation, you, you severe uh, diminish the, the LMTSN activity, suggesting this area are uh, not only antibody like the bond, but also this play an important role in recognize the fine warban factor. So once we know these are the area that antibody prefer to bind, and so we, we were asking a question whether we can actually do a little bit uh, face lifting so that the antibody won't see this part. So in order to do that, we made side direct mutagenesis and change some of the amino acid to a relative conserved partner. For example, changing arginine to lysine, or changing tyrosine to ferrin alanine, and which are pretty similar. You can see those side chain, uh, not changing too much. Once we did that, um, so we expressed those protein, and then we test the cleavage by FRET assay. And you can see, so white up if we give it a one, and this mutant with four or five residue being changed, altered, and you can see the activity seems to be not diminished, rather increased, which is a surprise to us. We normally don't see that. And more surprising to us, this is uh, not only that can it cleave peptide that way, but also cleave the multimeric beta in the same way. So that also increased, you know, about eight to tenfold. The interesting, really interesting stuff is uh, this, this mutant now, if you add a, a patient's antibody, and the patient antibody no longer be able to inhibit or inhibit very little, and the Y type or other mutant can completely inhibit if you add a patient antibody. The P stands for patient's antibody, and N means a normal plasma. So normal plasma don't inhibit the activity, but patient does. So this mutant can still be inhibited, but these variants cannot be inhibited completely. And with 12 patients that we had a high title autoantibody in the lab, and showing that almost all of them can, can inhibit the, this white type and also this, uh, the first two variants. But as, once uh, you start to see uh, some of them inhibiting, some of them don't, when you have three uh, residue uh, altered, if you change it four or five, only two patients seem to uh, still be able to inhibit it by to inhibit this, uh, this variant suggesting some patient may still have the other side, other binding side to inhibit the LMTSN activity. To identify the other uh, potential binding side, so we had uh, recently developed this, uh, it's called a hydrogen exchange, deuterium hydrogen exchange technology. Uh, basically, every protein has this amine hydrogen, and the hydrogen always exchange with their environment so if we, uh, the environment has a deuterium, and so D, D2H, then this will exchange. So uh, you can detect that by a mass spec after digesting this protein into the peptide. If you add antibody, so then this, uh, this part is completely covered or bind, and this part, it will not, no longer uh, subject to exchange. So the mass spec can tell from the, the peptide mass and you, you can see where the antibody exactly bind. By doing that, you can generate uh, hundreds and hundreds of peptide and overlapping peptide. Eventually, you can figure out exactly the amino acid that uh, the autoantibody bind, not just the, the peptide. So for example, this is a residue uh, in the protease domain. You see uh, with or without, this green is without antibody and red is with antibody. If you see these two lines travel together over time, this is the number of deuterium exchanged over time. Uh, if you see these two lines are overlapping, that means there's no, no difference. The exchanges happen and, uh, all the time, like this and here. So then if you look at this, this, this area, so the residue from uh, 632 to 42 or 41, and these, these peptides are overlapping. And so you can see, they are, uh, if in the presence of the alternate antibody, the monoclonal antibody, you can see that uh, the, the exchange is dramatically diminished. This is to, uh, uh, the same thing. And you can calculate the, the rate exchange 
if the exchange is not one, one means both with without anybody the exchange is the same way. And if they are uh, reduced, that means uh, we, in the presence of order anybody, the exchange was uh, slowed down and diminished. And so you can figure out this part of the antibody bonding. So now, if you go back and look at the sequence, this is the sequencing alignment of the spatial domain, partial spatial domain from a human mouse and zebrafish. They seem to be really conserved in the, on the LMTS-13. But these, these areas are not present in other members of LMTS family. So this is the area that this particular patient's antibody binds. And this is the area that I was talking to you before when we make a modification, and most of patients seem to bind this area, but a few patients seem to bind here too. So if you look at the crystal structure and you painted this antibody binding site, so one of them are here, and then the other one is next to each other. And they are all uh, solvent exposed, so that's good for antibody to bind. And they're also for the, the protease to interact with substrate. The question is, uh, can you actually confirm that, whether this part is actually important in terms of activity? So we made the deletion of this part of the residue and also partial deletion of either one, either part, and or make an alanine mutation. So you all show the first four seems to tremendously diminish the activity. And even if you make a single point mutation, sometimes it diminishes some of the activity. Interestingly enough, as similar to what we've shown in the previous study, if you make a really conserved mutation, then this activity can be preserved. So the question now is, can this mutant be inhibited by this antibody? If not, then that will be a very, very useful for our therapeutic. So the summary part three, uh, I've shown you a TTP patient harbor IgG autoantibody that targeted this exercise three and the exercise four in the spatial domain. Uh, therefore, they can interfere the NTS-13 VW interaction and cause a quiet TTP. I also show you that if you make a conserved substitution or a subtle modif modification of this, uh, this exercise, that will allow you to generate a novel NTS-13 variants that can be uh, used uh, to, uh, or that are resistant to autoantibody inhibition while still uh, maintain the LMTS-13 activity. Finally, I suggest that uh, so the data may suggest these variants can be uh, further developed for therapeutic of a uh, quiet TTP and perhaps uh, some other thrombotic disorder if they are indeed a uh, gain of function. Finally, I would like uh, to acknowledge the people who have done the work in the early days, when I, my lab just started, I have two uh, talented poster, uh, Julie, I, Ping Zhan, and they all work on the uh, early part of the structure function. And later on, I have uh, Wendy Chow, uh, who identified the, uh, the factor eight cofactor activity. And then uh, Chui Jian discovered this uh, gain of function and the other antibody resistant stuff. And Chris Skip identified the synergistic effect of factor eight and platelet on the cleavage. And then Veronica Cassina continue working on the hydrogen exchange experiment and try to identify the uh, antibody binding site and then modify them and continue. I cannot leave the podium without saying uh, Evan Sadler. Everything started uh, from his laboratory and he has been really supportive for all, everything I do. So, and I also have a lot of colleagues from Penn and Chop and the people from all over the world helped a lot. Thank you very much.